our surrender, Jesus. Our hot posture of worship, God, before you. Just like your word says, God, may us worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. Let our flesh take a back seat so our spirit man can arise and say, God, you're worthy of it all. We surrender our hearts, our lives, our agendas, circumstances, sickness, illness, God. To you, we give it to you in this place today, God. We want to encounter you in a fresh way. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We are so excited to have our Cooper City family in the house here at our Pensacola campus. Will you please help me welcome Pastor Carson and Jess to the back of the
love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we give, let's check out this video together. spearhead the global vision of Potential Church all across the world. And uh, we are Pastor Troy and Pastor Steph, our global lead pastors. We're their oldest kids, and uh, we also have two kids of our own. They're here with us this weekend. We have a three-year-old son, Lion, that is all craziness, all chaos, all the time. And our sweet little angel, Luna, who is eight months old. Yes, you know, I'm really excited to be here at Potential Church Pensacola, because if you didn't know, I was actually in my mama's womb at Potential Church. That's where it all started for me 30 years ago. You're like, wow. Either some of you are like, you're so young, or some of you are like, you're so old. Either or, it doesn't matter. I was in my mommy's womb at Potential Church. It all started at that time. It was Domingo Road Church. And I love standing here today at Pensacola because 30 years ago, Potential Church Pensacola was not the thing. You know, it was Flamingo Road Church. It was one church on the corner of a street in, uh, in Cooper City, Florida. And over the past 30 years, through our lead pastors and the, our honor of our parents, um, it has expanded. And now we have our broadcast campus at our Cooper City location. We have our potential Pensacola campus. And we have a campus all the way in Lima, Peru. Um, and it is just an honor that we get to stand here today and be able to worship together in one house under one God. And um, and it really is just a blessing. And, and when I think about the blessing, the verse that comes to mind is Psalm 118. And if you don't know, now you know. It says, today is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. So I just want to encourage you today that today you were created for a purpose. If you are excited that you woke up with some breath in your lungs this morning, right? God has given it to you. So don't give up today. You are a part of an exciting house of God. And we are excited to be here to partner with you. And it is our honor to do so. So if you would, I would love the opportunity to pray for you as we dive into the message today. So if you would, bow your head. Get with God alone. Maybe share with him in this moment the burden that you walked in here with today. Maybe the battle or the struggle that you're facing. Maybe the thing that you really need to release to him in this moment. Allow him to do a work in you. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus, we just thank you for this moment at Potential Church Pensacola, God. For every heart that's in this room, you brought them in here with breath in their lungs. God, we rejoice you today because you have made this day good and we will be glad in it no matter what is happening in our life, God. You have woken us up this morning with a purpose to chase after you. So we pray for whatever burdens happening in this room, God, whatever heart is struggling, wrestling, God, maybe with not knowing what their purpose is, maybe wanting to, to just end their life today, God, we just pray in this moment that you give them a sense of peace, 
that you speak to them. We pray over Pastor Tyler's message that it hits home like never before, that people walk out of here encouraged and inspired and closer to you because of this house of God that we serve. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Get up for my beautiful bride. What a great way to open up our time together. And, you know, I just want to echo what she said. I really believe that the best days for our church and also for this city have yet to come. You know, Zechariah 4.10 says, do not despise the days of small beginnings. And I think we all can agree after the few years that we've had coming out of COVID, we are all beginning again in some way or form. We're starting again in one way or another. And the word says, don't despise the days of small beginnings. Because one thing I know for certain is that you are still here. The enemy tried to take you out. He tried to destroy your destiny. But you are still here. We are still here. Potential is still here. And I believe that you are a part of this house. Not by accident. Not by coincidence. But by design. I still believe that there is a great wave of revival coming to this city. We're going to see marriages restored. We're going to see homelessness overcome. We're going to see the darkness flee in the name of Jesus. And God wants you to use you to be a part of it. And not just to be a part of it, but I believe to spearhead it. Because when I look at this room, I see a room of faith. And so I'm super, super honored to be here and to bring the word uh, this morning. And uh, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. Listen, I came ready to preach today. I hope you're ready. I came ready to preach. And not because I think that I'm the most profound or prolific speaker, but I'm preaching to myself this morning. This word that I'm going to share with you, I need myself. So I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. We are on this journey together. And, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm only going to speak for about two hours. All right? Just kidding. Just kidding. No. But um, if you got your Bible, turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. And This passage of scripture is taking place when the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness. And really... When you think about it, that encompasses a lot of books in the Old Testament. The Israelites are out of bondage. They've been released out of the bondage of Egypt, but they're not yet in the promised land. And I think that's a very relatable place in life. How many of you ever felt you've been delivered from your bondage, but you're not quite to the promised land yet? You're just kind of in that middle space where it feels stuck. And they're in uh, this place called Paran. And Moses sends out 12 spies. One from each of the different tribes of Israel. He sends out 12 spies to go and explore the land that God said he would give them as an inheritance. And in Numbers chapter 13, I'm going to start in verse 25. We're going to read a little bit of, well, not a little bit. It's kind of a lot of scripture up front. For some of you, this is more Bible than you've read all month, but it's okay. We're making up for lost time, and it's going to give you context for all that I want to share with you. But in Numbers 13, starting in verse 25. It says that after these spies explored the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the people of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them. They even brought back samples of fruit that they had taken from the land. And this was their report to Moses. We arrived in the land that you sent us, and it is indeed a magnificent country, a land flowing with milk and honey. I don't know if it was quite literal. I don't think they're meaning it's literally flowing with milk and honey, but I love both of those things very much. So I can, I picture rivers of, and not the 2% milk, not the almond milk, like the whole milk. You know what I'm saying? It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And here are some of its fruit as proof, but the people living there are very powerful. Then their cities and towns are fortified and very large. And then I'm going to skip to verse 30. Because after the spies kind of spread this report, yeah, it's a great land, but there are giants that live there. There are some powerful people that live there. And if we try and go up against them, we will surely die. And the people are like freaking out. And it says that Caleb tried to encourage the people as they stood before Moses. And he rose up and he said, let us go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. Verse 31. But the other men who had explored the land with him answered, we can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. And so they spread the discouraging reports about the land among the Israelites. And then if we skip ahead a chapter in Numbers chapter 14, I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. 
It said two of the men who had, who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. And they said to the community of Israel, they tore their clothing as a sign of grievance. They were grieving at this bad report that was spreading through the land. And they said, the land we explored is wonderful. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people living in the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And I believe that that's a promise that we can hold on to today. And I know that we've already prayed over our service, but if we can just go to God one more time in prayer as we open up this word. God, I pray that this word uh, would release us, God, into our full potential. I pray that you would remove every burden from our hearts and every distraction from our minds so that we can focus on what you have for us. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. We did not come here to be entertained. We came to be transformed. And we ask that we would leave this place Never to be the same again. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Everybody say amen. amen. So I have a question for you. How many of you have ever had the thought, this is just too good to be true? There is something about our flesh, about our human nature. We do not want to receive a good thing when it is like slapping us right in the face. And we often have the thought, this is too good to be true. And I remember back several years ago, uh, Pastor Choi and Pastor Steph were on a diet. Now, this is not really uncommon in our household. Pastor Troy, don't tell them I told you this, all right, because I'm sure they're going to be back soon. But they're always on a new fad, some type of diet. They're always looking, you know, to get fit, get healthy, get in shape. And this was back when the key, the, no, not the keto, the paleo lifestyle. Do y'all remember that? It was all about paleo when you were going to drop a bunch of pounds and look fit and look great. So our whole family was doing this paleo lifestyle together. And we were about... I would say maybe about four or five weeks into it. And there was a woman that attended our, our church in Cooper City. And she knew that we were doing this paleo diet. And she said, I'm going to make for you a paleo watermelon cake. And we all interpreted that as, an, you know, a moist, delicious watermelon flavored cake that is also paleo. Low calorie, low carbs, no sugars. And I'm telling you, for an entire week, we were excited about this watermelon cake. It is all we could talk about. We were looking forward to it. I mean, we, remember, we hadn't had any type of sugar, any type of frosting. You know, we, we, I don't know about you, but we like sweets in the Grambling home. And so we were looking forward to this. We could not wait. She brought it to church, and we said, we're not going to eat it here. We're going to take it home. And we are going to cut into this thing and enjoy this watermelon-flavored cake. It was beautiful. It was big. It was scrumptious. It was covered in white frosting. And after church, we get home, and we cut into that thing. And instead of finding a beautiful, moist, delicious cake. It was kind of hard. And we cut into it and realized this is not a watermelon flavored cake. This is actual watermelon. <laughs> With some cool whip kind of frosting on top. And I will tell you, it was the, the most disappointing thing that I might have ever experienced in my life. I'm not a fruit person. I mean, I like fruit flavored things, but I don't like actual fruit. And so I was looking forward to this watermelon flavored cake only to cut in and find all the seeds and all the juice and see, oh, she meant an actual watermelon. We were so disappointed. It was just too good to be true. It's such a disappointing feeling uh, to desire something that is like just out of reach, isn't it? And see, the Israelites felt this way. I mean, God had led them through the wilderness. They were literally right there, ready to inherit the land that God had promised them, only to find out that somebody else was inhabiting it. You know, maybe we feel that way today. Maybe you feel like somebody else is inhabiting the promise that God has placed in your life. Or somebody else is inhabiting the favor that you think that you deserve. But you see, Joshua and Caleb, they stood up and said, you know what? Yes, there are giants in this land, but God has given us this land as our inheritance. It belongs to us. You see, God will always make a way, but that doesn't mean it's going to be without challenges. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. And what I've learned is, 
You know, a lot of times we can find ourselves in that place where we have overcome so much. We've journeyed for so long, but yet we still seem so far from the future that we envision for ourselves. And if you feel that way today, can I tell you you're in good company? I bet every single one of us, if we were to get honest, has either felt that way at one point in our life or feels that way right now. And so I want to share with you, we've been in this series snapshot talking about overcoming the past, stewarding the present, and building for the future. And today I want to talk about stewarding the present. And I want to talk about some small choices that we can make today that will better our tomorrow. And the first one is this. We can either choose to delay or we can choose to obey. Now that doesn't sound super sexy, but, but that's the truth. We can choose to delay or obey. And in this story of the Israelites, of, of the spies going into the promised land, many of them wanted to delay rather than obey. And there's a big difference. In verse 30, Caleb says, it is time for us to go at once to occupy the land that God is giving to us. And there's a big difference between going and going at once. I don't know about you, but we have um, a three-year-old toddler, and he is a master, I'm sure like most toddlers are, at negotiation. And so, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. When he gets in trouble, he wants so badly to explain his innocence. And oftentimes, when he gets into trouble, we'll say, Lion, come here. And he'll take little shovel steps. He'll come about a quarter of the way, and he'll look up at us with those puppy dog eyes. And he'll do the pout. I'll say, Lion, come here. And he'll do a few more shuffles and he'll come halfway and he'll start to say, Dad, let's talk about it. Dad, let me explain. No lion, come all the way here. Daddy gave you a command. I want you to come right in front of me. We often tell him, obey right away. Obey right away. Because delayed obedience is actually disobedience. And I think the same works with God. When God gives us a command, when God says, hey, I want you to go to this city. I want you to take this promotion. I want you to encourage this person. I want you to venture uh, into this relationship. I want you to stay put. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. God expects us not to drag our feet, not to shuffle, but to go at once. You know, in those moments where I'm reprimanding my son, it takes me back to when I was younger. And I would remember we'd get in trouble. My mom would say, oh, go to your room. You wait till your father gets home. You know, you, you think Pastor Steph is all nice and cute and sweet, but she has a death look that can terrify you. And she even, Carson, tell me if I'm wrong, she has this little like, oh, kind of laugh that it's like, it is absolutely horrifying. She can be a scary woman when she wants to. And so, you know, she tells, go to your room, wait till your dad gets home. And we'd be up in our rooms and I would hear my dad say, Tyler, come downstairs. And I'd come up to the landing. And I'd say, hey, Dad, what's going on? Tyler would come down the stairs, and I'd come down to that like middle platform. I'd say, Dad, let me explain. I'll let, all right, let me share my side of the story. No, son, come all the way down. I'd come down a few steps. Dad, it was an accident. Son, come all the way down. I'd come down another step. Dad, I didn't mean to. He'd say, Tyler, come all the way down so that I can speak to you. And I think a lot of times God wants to speak to us. God wants to give us a word. But we're delaying. We're shuffling. We're standing on that middle ground. We're standing on that fifth step, not wanting to come all the way to God before we get that word. You see, delaying what God has for us never enhances our faith. It only enlarges our fear. When, when, when I would wait to come to my father when I was reprimanded, it never gave me courage. It only made me more afraid. It only gave me more anxiety. You see, the delay never enhances our faith. It only enlarges our fear. And we can't expect to be staring at the bottom of the mountain and the mountain to get smaller. That never happens. The longer you stare at a mountain, the larger it becomes. I preached in my message a few weeks ago at our Cooper City campus that a mountain is only a mountain when you're staring at it. But when you start climbing it, you see that it's actually your stepping stones. The delay never enhances our faith. It only enlarges our fear. And when we hesitate, when we delay, when we put off the word that God has laid on our heart, when we put off that directive, that command, we won't receive any of the blessing. Because you can't be halfway in, one foot in and one foot out and expect to receive God's full blessing. You know, Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 15 through 17, this is the message translation. It says, uh, God's saying, I know you inside and out. 
and I find little to my liking. Ouch. Somebody say, ouch. He says, you're not cold and you're not hot. Far better for you to be either cold or hot. You're stale. You're stagnant. And you make me want to vomit. Now, that is some strong language. That's a powerful scripture. Because what God is saying in that scripture is the worst thing that you and I become can become is not unredeemed, but lukewarm. One foot in with God and one foot out. We may know the scriptures. We can quote John 3, 16. Maybe we grew up in Sunday school and we've got a life verse that's posted in our bio on Instagram. But we haven't actually gotten around to applying the word to our life. We're not taking steps towards holiness. We're not taking steps towards godliness. We're half in and we're half out. And God says that is the worst thing that we can become. And when we're half in, half out, we cannot expect to receive any of God's blessing. You see, we've got to surrender and fully devote ourselves underneath the authority of God and his word in order to be positioned for his blessing. God is always ready to bless us, church. You don't have to pray for blessing. You don't have to convince God to bless you. He is ready to bless you. But have we positioned ourselves for that blessing? Are we being obedient? Are we being obedient in the small choices, the small decisions to be prepared for the big nudges? Are we being obedient when he sends us to this space? Are we being obedient when he gives us this command and this directive? Or are we delaying it? Oh, God, I'll pray about it a little bit more. I'll wait until my pastor, you know, confirms that. I'll wait until you send, oh, God, give me a sign, right? How often do we pray for signs and wonders? God, you know, send, you know, the, the rainbow. God, you know, open up the sky. Do all these magnificent things. And God says, listen, I've given you my word, and I have given you my Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you, that is guiding you. I have given you everything that you need to take that next step. And you know what? When we step out, God always provides the grace needed for the journey. Always. And you know what? Let's not mistake God's protection for God's blessing. God will protect us because he loves us. Just like I, I would I would jump in. If my son ran out into the traffic, I would run out there and I would jump in front of that moving truck or whatever it was, right? Uh, we protect our kids. God will protect us. But just because we are experiencing his protection does not mean that we have stepped into the fullness of his blessing. The only way to step into the fullness of his blessing is to fully surrender to him, to choose to obey. So don't let the delay rob you of your promised land, because that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to think about it a little bit longer. He wants you to keep staring at that mountain, hoping and praying that it will become smaller. But you know what? Maybe what God wants to do is actually give you the strength to start climbing. Sometimes God will remove the mountain, but other times he doesn't move the mountain. And other times he doesn't make it smaller. He doesn't make it any easier, but he gives you the strength to start climbing. We can choose to delay or we can choose to obey. We also have a choice whether we're going to take or reject. You see, when Joshua speaks to the children of Israel, he testifies, we are called to occupy this land. And yes, there may be giants that live there, but God's promised it to us. And we are called to take possession of it. And it got me thinking, you know, oftentimes God will call you to places where there is no welcome mat. God will call you to places where there is no welcoming committee. God will call you to places that are not just open spaces waiting for you to fill. A lot of times other people will be inhabiting that space. But it's not those who are supposed to be there. You may have to fight some internal battles. You may have to stand against some gossip. You may have to outlast some of those people that talk about you and didn't want you there in the first place. But friend, let me remind you today that God has not called you to easy. God has called you to impossible. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by my strength, it's by his spirit that we overcome and that we become victors. And so God's not called us to easy. He has called us to impossible. And there will always be a reason to run and hide. Always. There will always be, I am convinced, even in the best seasons of life, there will always be a reason to feel hopeless. In fact, if you were to take me to coffee after service, I could sit down with you and I could spout off 25 things right now that I have to be frustrated, overwhelmed, and feel hopeless about. 
If we look for the bad, we will always find the bad. There will always be a reason to run away and hide. But the word of God tells us in Timothy that he has not given us a spirit of fear. He has not given us a spirit of intimidation. He has given us a spirit of power. And we got to operate in that power. we got to stand firm on God's word knowing, you know what, I'm not going to run and hide. That is not what God created me for. That's not what he has equipped me for. I'm going to choose to stand firm. And devil, you can't talk me out of it. You can't talk me out of what God's promised me. You can't talk me out of what has my name on it. I am choosing to stand firm. There may be a storm that is passing through. But that's exactly what it's doing. It's passing through. Rarely do storms hover. They pass through. And so I'm going to stand firm. This storm is not going to take me out. And standing firm is not an idle stance. I hope you understand that. Standing firm, it requires some grit. you got to bend your legs. you got to get ready for the attacks that are coming from all sides. Standing firm is an aggressive stance against the enemy. And it's a stance that says, you know what? There may be darkness all around me, but God has already put a light of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of me. And the Word tells us that even though the darkness tries, the darkness cannot overcome the light. We cannot be overcome, church. We cannot be overcome. So we can't live in fear. We gotta choose to take possession of the promise. Take dominion of the destiny that God has before us. You know, we're not supposed to look like the rest of the world. I think a lot of times, as Christ followers, we try to fit in. Because we don't wanna be weird, and we don't wanna be judged, and we don't wanna be critiqued, and we don't wanna be criticized, right? But a lot of, but we gotta remember, God has not called us to be of the world. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to be emerged in the world, right? Not sitting up here on our, our pedestals, judging everybody beneath us. That's not going to bring anybody to Christ. We're called to be in the world, but not the same substance as the world. And that's what gets us recognized. You know, in Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas are traveling. And, and in Thessalonica, it's, uh, this is the crowd speaking. Paul and Silas have turned the rest of the world upside down. And now they are disturbing our city. Some translations say, now they have come here too. And I love that. You know, I pray that we can be the kind of believing believers that everywhere we go, people say the ones who have turned the world upside down, they've come here too. They've come to Pensacola. They've come to Gulf Breeze. They've come into this city. They've come into this neighborhood. They've come into this school. They've come into this space. And there's something different about it. They've got a joy that I can't quite put my finger on. They've got a peace, even though I know they're going through the roughest storm. And they're constantly inviting me to church. They're constantly telling me about this friend named Jesus. There's something different about them. My prayer is that people can look around and say, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And that's why I believe in the vision of potential church. And that's why I believe in our multi-site vision to be one church where you are. Not so that people can look at, ooh, potential church, how wondrous, how miraculous, no. But so that they can see the living Christ that lives on the inside of us. And they can say, wow, those who have turned the world upside down in Cooper City, in Pensacola, in Miami, in South America, in New York City, in New Orleans, in Los Angeles, they have come here too. So listen, take possession of the promise. Take possession of the dream, the God dream that God has put on the inside of your heart. I'm not talking about your dream that you're chasing, that pulls you away from God. I'm talking about the dream, the desire, the mission that God has put in your heart. Take possession of it because it has your name on it. And where I want to close this today is we have a choice either to see the obstacle or to see the promise. Or you might say we have a choice to either see the obstacle or see the miracle. And if we reread verses 27 through 28 in Numbers chapter 13, right, the, the, Joshua and Caleb gave a good report, but 10 of the spies, remember there were 12, 10 of them were so fearful. They only saw the obstacle and they couldn't see the promise. Their view was so obstructed that they could not see the very thing that God wanted to bless them with. They saw that it was a good land. They saw that it was abundant. They saw that it was great, that it was beautiful, that it was everything that they could hope or dream of. 
But yet all they could focus their attention on was the giants that lived there. So much so that they couldn't see the promise that God wanted to bless them with. But see, Joshua and Caleb saw things differently. You might say that they saw it from a different perspective. They were looking through a different lens. See, they saw what God saw. They saw that this is an exceedingly good land. They saw abundance, not lack. They saw victory, not defeat. And none of this had manifested in the physical. They were looking to the spiritual. They were looking to the supernatural because they knew that their God was a supernatural God. They saw what no one else saw. They saw what God saw. And my question to you today is what do you see? When you look at the challenge in front of you, when you look at the dream that God's placed in your heart, when you look at your ministry, when you look at your family, what do you see? Do you see the pain and the suffering or do you see the promise of God? Because within every single tragedy, there is a treasure. Joshua and Caleb saw what God saw and they didn't know at the time why God was sending them to this land. Listen, God didn't need them to go explore the land because God needed them. God already knew what the land looked like. He already knew uh, what the crops were like. He already knew that there was a harvest ready to be picked. God didn't send them because he needed the report. God was putting out a leadership test to see who will see what I see. I know that there's suffering. I know that there's giants. I know that there's battles that have to be overcome. But who will see what I see? Because I see a harvest that is ready to be picked. I see a fruitful land. I see overcomers. I see a generation that is being built up on a firm foundation. Who will see what I see? You know what? I think when God looks into this room right now, I think that God sees a group of warriors. Because that's what I see. I see a group of warriors. I see some people that have been through some things. I see some people that have lived a lot of life and have earned a lot of wisdom because how many of you know wisdom doesn't come for free? Wisdom is hard earned, that's what Proverbs says. Uh, I see a group of overcomers. I see a group of faith-filled people that are ready to stir up the community and the space around them. And I love what 1 John 5 verse 4 says. It says the conquering power that brings the world to its knees is our faith. How amazing is that? The conquering power. The power that overcomes every challenge, every burden, every distraction, every setback, every frustration, every disappointment. And brings the world to its knees is our faith. Something that cannot be seen, but it can be felt. You see, when you get on your knees, it's actually a very humbling posture. And when I think about how my God journey began, this is where it began, was on the knees. I remember being seven years old at a small church that my parents had planted in a town, Paragould, Arkansas. I'm sure you've been there. There's lots to do. No. Small town, small church. And I remember sitting in that auditorium. I got to travel back there recently for my grandfather's funeral. And I got to go back to the exact place where I met Jesus. I can tell you everything about that moment. I can tell you the lady that was speaking and sharing her testimony. I can tell you about the ugly orange sweater that she was wearing the whole time. I can tell you her testimony that she was giving. And I remember in that small town church, in that small town that you've never heard of and probably will never go to, the almighty God, the creator of the universe, pursued my heart while I was on my knees. And some of us, we just need to get back to this stance today. We've been standing on our own two feet. We've been trying to do it in our own strength. We've been trying to work it out in our own minds, in our own strength. And we just need to get back down on our knees before God. Because right where our faith begins is where it sustains. The decision I made on that day is still the very same decision that sustains me today. The truth that I came into knowing that there is a God that loves me, there is a God that called me, there is a God that created me for a purpose. That same revelation that I got at seven years old 
is the same revelation I have today. It's the same faith that keeps me going. And we are called to have a faith that brings the world to its knees. And I see that kind of faith in this room. I see a faith that has the power to dismantle the darkness. I see a faith that has the power to change the culture in this city. I see a faith that has the power to put the devil to shame and overcome every one of his schemes. I see the faith that can pull down strongholds. I see a faith that can defeat addictions and insecurities and lies from the enemy. I see a faith in this room that has the power to bring the world to its knees and compel people all across Pensacola, Cooper City, South America, Miami to say those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So stay obedient and stay the course. Too many people get off right before they see the victory. Because they get tired, they get overwhelmed, they get frustrated, they start to think it will never, if it was supposed to happen, it would have happened by now. How do you know that? Are you God? Right? No one, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Right? We know that a, a thousand years is but a day to the Lord and a, a day a thousand years. He does not work on our timetable. And what I've learned about God is when he wants to, he will redeem lost time. He can make happen what should have taken nine years. He can make happen in nine months. That's the kind of God we serve. You may say, well, you know what? If it was supposed to happen, it would be easier. Says who? That's not what my Bible says. If that was the case, we don't need any of this. If it was supposed to be easy, we don't need any of it. You know what? God gave us his word to encourage us, to remind us to stay steadfast, to be encouraged. Even we have every reason to be discouraged, to praise him, to worship him, to shout his praises from the mountaintop, even though we're living in the valley. Stay strong. Stay steadfast. Choose to be obedient in the now. Because how you steward the present, the small decisions you make today, whether to go or whether to stay. And sometimes God asks us to stay. And I was uh, um, uh, talking to one of the young adults at our Cooper City campus last week that's working at Chick-fil-A. And they were just going on a rant about Chick-fil-A. And I was like, oh my gosh, I thought they were supposed to love Jesus. <laughs> and she was just ranting. She's like, I just need to get out of there. And I said, hold up. Maybe you don't just need to get out of there. Maybe you don't just need to get out of the frustration or the suffering. Maybe you actually need to submit under it. Because God will not always pull us out of it. Sometimes he wants us to remain so that we can learn who he is. You know how I discover the different names of God? By experiencing them. You can't know him as Jehovah Jireh, your provider, until you have a need and he provides for you. You can't know him as Jehovah Rapha until you've been sick and you need his healing. You can't know him as El Shaddai until you experience him showing up in your life in a mighty and powerful way. Sometimes we got to submit to that suffering so that we can really get to know who God is. So friend, be strong. Obey. Take. And see the promise that lies within your obstacle. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for your word. My words are never enough, but your word has stood the test of time. It can be trusted. God, it is our saving grace. It is your promise over our life. It is your love letter to us. So God, we receive this word, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, because the devil is not afraid of us coming and hearing the word. He's afraid of us applying the word. He's afraid of us actually living out what we have heard and received today. So God, I pray that this word would take root in our hearts. I pray that it would work its way out into our behaviors and actions, God. I pray for the revelation of the Holy Spirit, God. That we would be obedient today, knowing that the decisions we make today set us up for tomorrow. God, we know that you have created us on purpose, for a purpose, and I just speak life over every single person in this room. 
I declare that they are created by you, that they are a masterpiece, that they are the victor, not the victim. They are the head and they are not the tail, God. You created them for greatness. You created them with intentionality. You created them with, with a purpose. And God, they are not here by accident. They are a part of this house for such a time as this to use the giftings that you have created them to reach a dying and broken city. And so God, I proclaim your blood over them. I ask for your blessing upon them, God. I pray that every arrow and attack from the enemy stop dead in his tracks in this moment, God. I declare that no weapon formed against them and their families shall prosper, God. I declare that they shall live and not die, but to declare the works of the living God. And I declare that your house will be a house of prayer and will be a house of miracles and that people from all over Pensacola will say, what's going on in that building on the corner of Keating and Creighton, God? There's something powerful. There's a presence. And so we ask for that, God. We ask for your blessing. And it is in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Everybody said, come on, amen, amen, amen. I love you guys. God bless you. service, we are going to have prayer up front, so if anyone has something they want to pray about or someone that they just want to borrow our faith so that you can be encouraged as you go out into this week, we would love to pray with you guys. And this being Super Sunday, we have Sneaky Tiki Snow Cones after service, so make the noise for some Sneaky Tiki. It's going to be awesome, so right after service out front, feel free to grab snow cones. It's our way to say thank you so much for hanging out with us this weekend. Well, as we wrap up the service, let me pray God's blessing and speak his word over each and every one of us. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. So Father, we pray a blessing over each person here. And Lord, we claim revival. A great wave of God is coming to Pensacola and we are positioning ourselves for more of your presence as we see this city radically turned upside down for your glory. It's in Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen. Y'all have an amazing week. And be sure to show us some Southern hospitality to our Cooper City friends before you guys leave. God bless you guys. Have a great week.